1992, there has been an archaeological dig in Hoxton. This dig, which you are about to see, is the result of research by Margaret Carey Evans into the cult of St Edmund there that lasted several centuries. Now, Margaret, do tell us what first interested you in this subject. Well, when my husband and I came to live at Hoxham in 1962, I already knew of the tradition that St Edmund had been martyred at Hoxham. His main cult, of course, was at Bury, uh, in the great abbey there, where his body was enshrined. But it had long been thought that the place of the actual martyrdom was Hoxham. But when I looked it all up in the Oxford Book of Saints, I discovered to my surprise that he was said to have been martyred at Helsden, Norfolk. This intrigued me, so I thought I would try as a sort of hobby to find out all I could about the connection of St Edmund and Hoxham. But Margaret, why should it ever have been thought that St Edmund was martyred at Helsden? Well, it really goes back to the very first account of the martyrdom, which was written about a hundred years after he was killed by the Danes in 869. According to the very first account written by a monk called Abbo in about 950, uh, he was murdered at a place called Hegel's Doom. Well, throughout the Middle Ages, Hegel's Doom was thought to be just another name for Hoxham. But at the beginning of this century, historians were not satisfied with that, and they were very much studying place names. And of course, it would be absurd to say that Hoxham could have derived from Helston. And they decided that the only place which did coincide with Hegel's Doon was Helston, Norfolk. After thinking this over, I decided I must find out all I could about the connection between the saint and Hoxton. And in order to do this with some sort of historical, mm, historical certainty, I got in touch with a great friend of mine who is a medieval historian and put me onto material which up till then had never been dealt with before. Well, with Miss Dodwell's help, I had access to a, a lot of documents uh, which, sh which showed uh, that the very first account of the martyrdom actually in a document was when Bishop uh, Lozenga was founding his great cathedral in Norwich and he appropriates the um, chapel of St Edmund at Hoxham to the service of his cathedral. So we know that in about 1200, at, at, at the latest, the place was already connected with St Edmund. There was a, a chapel there already. But Miss Dodwell put me on to two hitherto unknown charters, which showed in fact that this chapel had existed at least a century earlier. And this was a very particularly interesting because it brings the sanction, as it were, of Berry um, to the idea that St Edmund was connected with Fox. Well, this ch in this, these charters, which I won't go into in detail, it was perfectly clear that there was already this very ancient chapel dedicated to St Edmund. And by the charter, the governor of Berry himself, who was a very rich and important man, and his wife, obtained possession of the chapel with the purpose of building it up either into a new building 
or enlarging what was already there. And this actually took place. And at the death of the governor of Berry, it passed back to the cathedral priory in Norwich, but only on the condition that a little monastery was uh, attached to the chapel. And this became a priory cell of the cathedral priory of Norwich. And from this cell evolved the whole cult of St. Edmund, based on the idea that he had been murdered at Hoxham. We're not quite sure at what date this cult began, because many of the documents uh, have been destroyed or lost. Um, but at any rate, by the year 1300, we do know that there were two chapels in operation. Uh, you may wonder why there were two chapels, but if you remember the, the, the account of the martyrdom of the saint, he was murdered in one place, but when the Danes had cut off his head, they took the head and they and buried it in a, in a wood uh, because they wanted to prevent Christian burial. And it was only by a miracle that the head was found, uh, guarded by a wolf, sent by God to prevent the destruction of the head before it was found. And the head itself calling out, here, here. Well, because there were two aspects of the, of, the, of the murder, the actual place where he was martyred and uh, the place where the head was found, there had to be two chapels in two different places in Hoxton. And one chapel we know was the chapel connected with the monastery. And we also know from the long tradition that that was a cross street. And we know from the archives of the little priory that these two chapels were called by two different names. And that one was called the Great Chapel, and this we take to have been the Priory Chapel, and that the other one was called the New Work, or Newark Chapel. Well, the one which belonged to the Priory was destroyed at, at the dissolution of the monasteries. But the other chapel continued to exist. But where was that? And eventually my researches really turned on this question of finding out where was this other chapel. And it was that that led finally to the archaeological dig. Eventually, I found uh, several sources which gave us, gave me more or less an idea of where about in Hoxton this chapel could have been. For one thing, it was very well known by the 14th century, and a certain poet who lived up in Lincolnshire, who wrote a poetical life of St. Edmund in English, uh, it told his, his readers that Hoxham was the place where the saint was killed and that there were two chapels there. One was a fair chapel which commemorated where the head was found and the other was a lesser chapel where the murder had taken place and that these two chapels were one mile from one another. Well, as we already knew that one chapel was in Cross Street, it meant that somewhere or other the other chapel was within a radius of one mile. Then I further found out that uh, the first lord of the manor, uh, Sir Robert Southall, in his will, left some of the priory lands in legacy, and he describes them. There were certain fields, and among these fields was one called Chapel Field. And the mention of Chapel Field with the surrounding fields was definite enough for us to find them all on a map, a state map of 1787. So we therefore had some sort of clue as to 
the whereabouts, but not the actual site. The next thing to be done, having the general idea, was to try and find out on the actual land whether there was any sign of a building ha having existed. And at this point it seemed right to call in professional help. And we got in touch with the archaeological unit in Berry, and Mr. Bob Carr came over and organised a field walk on the site that we had pinpointed. I ought also have told you, in fact, which I've forgotten for the moment, that what really made uh, pinpointed the thing was an aerial photograph that Philip had produced for us. And this map was taken in 1973, where all the hedges were still in existence, marking all the fields. And we could compare that with the older maps with the field names on and actually s find out where Chapel Peace was and, and the actual chapel. And on that side, the field walk took place with very, very gratifying results because the most extraordinary amount of very high class glazed tiles were found and a piece of bronze, which eventually was decided to have been part of a, of a bell, a bell hanging place, I don't know. And um, in fact, Bob Carr was, was completely satisfied. He, he wrote a, a report which showed that that was the site, that it was the site of a, of a building of some importance and not a farmhouse. And for the moment, things rested there. But he also came to the conclusion that it would be in interesting uh, to see if there was any fabric left. Well, at this point, I retired. For one thing, I was no longer able to walk very well, and I couldn't do all the rough walking and so on. And I handed the next stage over to Norman Midgley and, and Philip Gunton and other people who were interested. So that the story really goes on from there. Early after his murder by the Danes in the 10th century, this is the local ruling. The field which we're standing in, or a particular part of this big field which we're standing in, was known this chapel field up in the 17th century. But since then the old boundaries have long since gone. And this is just in the centre of a very large field. And in the back you can see the farm at Cross Street, which is Mr. Havers's. Work is still continuing. And at the moment, having taken a very careful map of the area, is still continuing as you can see over there and every object is marked on the map. It's extremely interesting. A lot of dedicated work being carried out by the Suffolk County Council archaeological section. This is a very, very particular item. The thickness of the wall can be clearly seen. Here's the eye with the image over there. We were looking at the northwestern edge, the corner of the building. Those foundations. 
I'm looking now towards the southwestern edge. This is Mrs. Carrie Evans seated in the chair. That's the west end. Yeah, really. Well, it seems to be locked. It's a bit inspired the whole of this investigation. Yes, it's um, 16 by 28. Edward the first. It wasn't actually in the building, but that would put mean that there was somebody around here in about 1300. Today. Oh, good. Um, I started walking the field and then this day came out early in the morning and uh, carried on looking at the field and I was saying, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. every parish has, it, has evidence of prehistoric activity, Iron Age Road, and so on, and that's what I want to look at. And in this field, it's quite remarkable. I mean, it's an enormous great field now, yes, yes. but I mean, at one time it was broken yes. up into well, we, about we, seven we altogether. Yes, uh, uh, right. Right. That's right, yeah. that's right, and, uh, and of course the uh, little plantation that was uh, yeah. here as well. Um, so I looked at the outside of the field itself to start with a bit what you call hill wash, which brings the material down to the edge of the field itself. So I looked at that, and also the fact that you've got a major green lane over there, you've got, and of course you've got uh, South Green, just a little bit further beyond uh, the plantation over there. Um, so it's quite an active area, and uh, up on that uh, um, high you've got the other green as well. So you're situated as well between two greens, um, which again, I suppose, well, greens um, were the marginal land of each parish. They were set up in the medieval, they were a major feature of the medieval period. And in this area, there were certainly, they appeared in the landscape in the 13th century onwards. And it was the land that was left after the church and after the, um, the hierarchy had taken off the best land they were farming it, they were using it, so all that was left were what they call the marginal land or the wasteland. So the smaller people, they had that, and on the site, with tile, yes, tile there in blacks, and all their ha um, holdings and uh, rich pickings that they had over the years. Um, then it was a logical place. It was it was well, a good position at the point as well. We've got the abbey just on the road. Well, the and we've got further just as you see. Very, 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 Yes. Uh, a chapel dedicated to 
Inside that higher um, structure where we've got the wall base. And we've lost in this area, we've got virtually no no roof tile fragments. So this, the roof tile fragments are fading away. And we've got a clean edge, which is the edge of this chalky boulder clay. So the, the preservation, in fact, decreases as you go across the building in that direction until you get to this top corner, yeah. which I haven't drawn yet, obviously, but where, where we've got virtually nothing to do. But I'm, I'm going to have to go back now that the top team have, have finished clearing this, and I can see that edge much more clearly. I'll better add that. I'll probably add it to this drawing rather than make a separate drawing. Um, and we can see that now, that now that this is planned and recorded, it's quite legitimate to take the data away, so we've, we've, we've removed, the, removed the evidence, and uh, we get a chance of seeing what's underneath. So that's the next phase for tomorrow, or the day after, is we'll take all of this interior material out until we get to this level, which I think is already, as it's, it's already on virgin ground. So this Deadman's Chapel. We aren't going to try and dig the whole lot. You'll see that what they've done is to go below the surface, which was level with the tops of the wall when, we did, when you saw it last in July. And we're just going down to see how far the foundations go. Fortunately, we've got a decent day, and we should be able to make very good progress today. But of course, coffee breaks must come into it sometime. Well, it worked all morning. As you can see now, the shadows are lengthening. And this is what we can now show you.
Here is the eastern end of the building. And we have dug down this morning to endeavour to find the blast. We have been trying to found, find the bottom of the foundations. But so far we've not done so. We've gone down about two feet. What we've been concentrating on this last few days of November is defining the level of the foundation. What we've discovered in the summer was the base of the wall with the mortar footings which can be seen in the front of the front foreground. Um, what can be seen in the left middle distance and distance are the top of the gravel footing which underlies the mortared uh, wall base. We've discovered that it, it is a heavy gravel deposit, which we'll look at in a minute. The interior of the building has been cleaned up. You can see on the right-hand side, in the centre, the last remaining fragment of the yellow clay floor, which was either a floor in itself or perhaps a floor base for, uh, for tiles. But apart from that, we've cleaned the rest of the interior of the building down to orangey brick earth subsoil just to make sure that there are no signs of post holes or building slots for a preceding structure. And really we found no signs of that at all. There are areas of burning in the, the left middle distance showing underneath that clay floor and in the foreground around about the ranging pole there are other areas of general disturbance, probably I would say uh, shrubs and trees growing in the building after it, the, the roof had come down. On the right hand side you can see that we've been beginning to dig out the footings on the south wall, really because that was an area where an awful lot of tile from the roof collapse was concentrated and we're trying to discover whether they robbed out a doorway on the south side and that's certainly where we would expect the doorway to be. At the minute the results are not particularly specific. I can't say exactly what's going on, but it appears to be disturbed footing with tile in it, whereas in the trench at the foreground, which we're still working on, the footing is just of gravel. It's very clean, there's no tile, no bone, no oyster shell, none of the other things we found elsewhere on the site. And as you can see, it's deep. It's at least uh, a metre down, and we haven't reached the bottom yet. So it's got a very substantial footing indeed. Since Bob Carr made those remarks, I don't know. they did another day's excavation on the Thursday and they've discovered in fact that the depth of the foundations is now approximately a metre deep, far deeper than we thought, but it shows up quite clearly. Also, what has put the... the um, upset all our calculations is that when they were concluding their excavations on that Thursday they discovered this. The plane has gone. The original ground level was here and this is mortar which has fallen off from the roof with all these piles on top of it. Now this mortar, seen down here. This, uh, this layer of mortar also comes down in a sort of semicircle here. Will you Suggesting just do that curve again, please, slowly? Yes. This mortar tends to come round in a semicircle yes. like that, which suggests an indentation in the ground. And there, going down like that, is a hole in the ground filled with yellow clay, hard clay, quite different from this sandy soil here. It appears to be that deep. And 
would have been a hole where a post has been extracted and this yellow clay has been used to fill the hole. What moment do you think it would have been extracted? Somebody getting it out to you, reuse it in some way, or what? Well, if uh, if the whole building was taken down, well, if it and if there'd been a wooden porch with a very good post, they would have taken the post. Well, I think myself that when they were digging this trench for the foundation, anything that was in the way was taken out. This was one of the things they yeah, from the original ground level. Well, you couldn't go much more than six to eight feet above ground, otherwise it wouldn't stay. True. If it was a building, it would have been a low building. Yes. yes. Well, people weren't so tall in those ages, didn't they? Otherwise they'd have gone in. Anyhow, it gives us plenty of thought for next year. Today is the 25th of April, 1993, and we have restarted on the excavations of the chapel site. John is here. contractor comes in, he takes the wall away, mm. um, somebody gets the corner, gets a bit power away, young, young Fred the apprentice, he digs, he digs into the floor, mm. and then parts of the tile floor, because I could be stood on where that, those tiles came from, okay. so just, just over. get whoosh in. Yeah. It's either that, or those have been incorporated in the footings and they come from there. Well, here we are again. It's uh, it's April 1993 this time. The last time we were together was was November. We've had three days trying to sort out the, the building. You can see over to the left we've we've opened up the excavation and taken in about another eight foot width outside the south wall. We can look at that in a moment. The other thing that we've specifically tried to do is look at the foundation trench which was exposed last time. You'll remember that we had dug one hole in it in the middle of the south wall and we've now extended that slightly and found that in that area the foundation is very nearly five feet deep. It's a quite remarkable depth for a foundation width of just over two feet. You can see Mike Hardy looking down the hole now and the, the top of the ranger pole sticking out of it, just showing 60 centimetres visible. The footing is made out of gravel which has been packed in and in that gravel there's a certain amount of tile and brickwork if you come down towards the east end, Peter and Norman are working, we find that the gravel is shallow, but 
Peter is between the five feet. Well, that would be Peter's knee, I suppose, so it's only about uh, two foot, two foot six. Stop for a moment. Okay. Then go forward and sail. You want to get a view down? Yeah, you do. The, the muffle goes down, off you go. Just walk off the edge. Well, this is the this is the deepest part of the the foundation trench that we found so far. To the right and left, we've left the uh, the gravel footing material still in there. We've just dug right down to the bottom in that one area, and you can see in the middle of the side wall the clay packing of what we think is the post hole, or something like that, which we're guessing is is uh, related to a porch or some other feature on the south side of the building. But we haven't really done enough digging up on the top surface here to find any more of that. But there is a layer of uh, mortar spreading outside where I think the south door lintel would have, the south door jam would have been. This is a, a, a bronze casting counter that we found just outside the area of the south door. You can see that there's a cross in the middle and then there's an inscription which we can't read, it's too badly corroded, around the outside. And on the reverse, if I can manage to turn it over, there's a floral pattern which I think includes fleur-de-lis and this is a the reason for saying suggesting it's French probably of the 14th or 15th century it's rather hard you'll understand to date it at this stage until we've got it cleaned and had a good look at it You do your business first. This is the north wall, and we found out by digging down the other side of the wall that the foundations slope. And then there's this hole in the bottom which has been packed with flints. I'm not sure what it means at this stage, but it's another of these conundrums that this site has been giving us. You see, they are very closely packed. And today is the 29th of April, 1993, and um, this is the last day of the excavations which are taking part, taking place now until the next ones are held in September when the crop will be harvested and all a lot of the work at school have been completed. Bob Carr is over there making his final notes and sketches. Unclear. In fact, it seems very unlikely that it, that it could have been added to because the building is obviously an entire feature. It, it couldn't have been expanded. And it never had an apse, did it? No. It always ended as a rectangle. Yes, we, we cleaned that end off, and there was no evidence of the building extending beyond this, this area. Um, it's just an interesting, distinctive layer which I can't explain. Um, the other 
inexplicable thing at the moment. This side is... I don't think you saw this yesterday, did you? Or on Tuesday, down at the yeah, bottom. They were doing it out, I remember. Yeah. Yes. Well, Fireman John has now got to the bottom. So this is undisturbed soil, and this is this. There's a little trench cut through which stops here. This is an undisturbed natural. So we've got a an exceptional depth deepening just there. Now how far it goes, uh, I don't know, but I presume it must stop. It's more like to stop here than it is anywhere else in between. So there's a there's a, a, a deepening, more or less in the middle of the north wall. What for? It's got big flints in it as well, down at the bottom. Not not of course at the door. We were looking for a door one time. Yes. During an occupation. Mm -hmm. yes. That's right. It's a nice summertime occupation. Come and rebuild yes. the chapel. Yes. <laughs> it's quite a substantial amount, really, wasn't it, too? Right, well, I, I think I'll probably... We, 